and welcome to Earthlings Christmas and New Year special with Lyra and Ben. And today our topic is about the Buddha Dharma and meditation. So Ben, please tell me what the Buddha Dharma means and how did it change your life? Well, the Buddha Dharma is, I guess, basically just the teachings of the Buddha, um, directly translated from Sanskrit. And how has it changed my life? In quite a few ways. I think the primary four ways would be that I'm really, really lucky to have a human existence and not just any human existence. I have a human existence that's actually quite good. I have food, family, friends, um, enough money, enough love, and this is something that's actually very, very precious in the Buddha Dharma, is to have the conditions to be able to practice and to be able to learn. I think the second thing that's really, really changed my life is the recognition of impermanence. And to know and to understand that absolutely nothing lasts forever. And to have this played over and over and over and over in my Buddhist life is just so crystal clear that no matter how hard I try to hang on to things, it's better to just let go of them. <laughs> the third thing is probably karma and to really, really understand how every moment of every day I'm planting seeds. And I just really have to decide what I want to grow. Do I want flowers and vegetables and fruit trees to grow? Or do I want you know, weeds and thistles? And I'm the one who's responsible for that. Every moment and every day, I choose what's going to come up in my life in the future. Because I can directly see how all of the mistakes that I've made in the past have come back in some way or another to give me the current conditions that I have. The fourth thing that's probably the most important is the goal or the yeah the, the end game of, of the practice of the Buddha Dharma. Um, many people call it enlightenment, or um, I just like to say just your full potential. And to be able to more and more realize every day what I'm capable of, what I can do, and how I can help others in a more meaningful way. And um, yeah, that's the, the four things that have really, really changed my life. Yeah, it sounds like a lot. It is. And how long did it take you to get to all these realizations? Hmm. I'm not there yet. Um, but I have been practicing for about 11 years now, a little over 11 years, and I still keep on finding new and profound ways how the teachings have helped and changed my life. And I don't think that that stops. I think it's a continual experience of newness and new understandings and new depths and um, new ways to be as I said it again, and I'll say it one more time, um, loving and compassionate. Yeah, that sounds good. What I was wondering is um, if you would say that the meditation had a direct influence on the healing in your life. Mm -hmm. Definitely it has. Probably the most important way that my meditation practices have influenced my healing in my life is to be able to learn to be fearless. And so there's two ways to look at this. The first way is on, yeah, on the meditation cushion. <clears throat> One has to be fearless about letting things go in the practice. Like you're not hanging on to distractions. You let them go. You're not hanging on to the good things, the bad things. You're just constantly letting go and, and then moving on. And also, sometimes when you're sitting there, things come up within your mind. It's more on an intuitive level 
or an insightful level that uh, that one sometimes needs to be fearless, really, really fearless, and to look really, really deeply within. And when I extrapolate from the meditation cushion into my daily life, I think that the um, that this fearlessness of looking at those dark corners of my past, my history, and my friends, my relationships, my family, and, and really, really looking very, very closely, without judging, but certainly, most importantly, without fear, and to just say, yeah, that's how it was, that's what I did, that's how it went, worked out. I think this is a, a really big part of the practice. And then, of course, coming back to what I said earlier, is then you have to let it all go. And it is if you have discovered something within yourself, that you don't like, you certainly don't want to hang on to it. <laughs> and so you have to practice this letting go. And this is, this is exactly what's happening in the meditation practice. There are a couple of practices that I've done that are directly about building things up and letting them go, building them up and letting them go. And this is primarily how a lot of Tibetan meditation works, as you build up this big, beautiful picture of a Buddha in front of you. And then in the end, you dissolve it all and you let it go, and then you rest. And this has some interesting effects on you as well, as, as on your personality, on your psyche, is that you're constantly visualizing something so beautiful, like these guys behind us. We're visualizing something so golden and rich and perfect. And we start to understand this as a mirror, the mirror of our mind, and that we can only imagine something so beautiful because this beauty is actually within us. I can't imagine something that's not within me. That doesn't make any sense, does it? So when I do all of this and then I have to let it go, there's this moment of unease. And there's this moment of, it's called grasping actually, where the, where the mind says, I've dissolved something, but now I need something. And the mind, my mind literally reaches out and, and grasps where the red car, the, the beautiful girl, uh, the this, the that. And, then, and this is the moment when you have to be really, really fearless that you say, okay, my mind doesn't need something to grab onto. I can just rest in, in all that there is. And yeah, this is, this is a really interesting process. What, what you practice on the meditation cushion is directly related to my experiences in life. Yeah. And it's, it's fun. <laughs> That's really interesting. So in the end, you would say that fear is blocking the healing. If you, on the contrary, say that being fearless of what comes up would be the most important thing you learned about healing. Oh, for, me, for me, definitely. Uh, fear has been a, a big part of uh, the, what I've needed to heal. And, and to be able to look at it in a, in a controlled way, just with me sitting in a room or even in a big group, but it would a controlled way when, like, when I close my eyes in the meditation. And this was the big, really, uh, it's an easy beginning. It's like easing into the, to the healing um, when I'm sitting on the meditation cushion. And yes, it's taken years. And um, that's the hard part for a lot of people is that it's maybe not a fast process, but it's a profound and thorough process. Yeah, that's true. Ryan, you've mentioned the meditation practice now a few times. What would you say are the most important things to do in the meditation practice? Mm. The most important things to do in a meditation practice, um, definitely regularity is important. That's why it's called a practice. It's something that you have to actively, physically engage in practicing. Um, like any athlete in the Olympics, you don't get to the Olympics just by deciding, oh, I'd like to go to the Olympics tomorrow. It doesn't work like that. This is a, a practice that people have been doing for years. It's a discipline. And you have to sometimes physically make yourself do the practice. You have to sit down, you have to make time. Making time today in our busy schedules is probably the hardest thing, the hardest challenge that we all have, 
uh, children, traffic, <laughs> work, uh, annoying relatives and family, whatever comes up. Yeah, there's always this constant demand on our time. But if I can give myself 15 minutes a day in the beginning, or even 10 minutes a day if you're really, really tight, in the beginning it's difficult, but I can promise you after a little while, you'll generously beg for the time to sit on the cushion. It'll be the first thing you want to do when you come home because this is the time when your mind actually gets to rest. And uh, meditation is mind's greatest gift to itself. And it becomes more and more joyful because you want to do it. And this is, this is it's, it's, it's fun. After a while, it becomes really, really fun. And then afterwards, the investment that I've taken by sitting on the cushion is paid back 10 times because I'm more focused, I'm more effective, I'm more relaxed in all of the other things that I try to do in life. And that's really important for me. I also think that uh, any type of practice requires a little bit of experimentation. And there's lots of things you can experiment with. I mean, you can experiment with what type of cushion you want to sit on. Is it wide? Is it tall? Very simple, yeah? And how does that affect even my posture? And my posture is also part of the experiment. Do I like to sit with my hands on my knees? Do I like to sit with my hands like this? Do I like to sit with my finger and my nose? I mean, all of these things, you have to try them and kind of feel them out into what makes sense. Is meditation better in the morning? Not for me, but in the evening, absolutely. It makes total sense for me to meditate in the evening. Um, is once a day enough? Or is it better if I have a half an hour to do two 15-minute sessions a day? And you can't just do this once and figure it out. You kind of have to do it one way for a couple of weeks and then another way for a couple of weeks and kind of see the long-term effect. And this is why um, it's, it is a big experiment. And it's important also to be flexible within this experimentation and to say, okay, well, okay, I know this is the experiment that I'm doing, but I'm just gonna do it this way today. And uh, I've only got five minutes today, or I can't meditate at all today, but maybe what I'll do is when I'm walking out to the car or going for a walk, I'll do uh, some just some breath relaxation work or something like that. Or I'll, I'll picture the I'll picture my llama in my mind and bring him into my heart center for a little while. And sometimes that's all I manage in a day. But as long as there's a little bit every day, and I'm flexible and I experiment with it, this is this is really important. But probably the biggest thing is to never ever give up. And even in the toughest times of my life where I've gone through challenges and, you know, maybe even been depressed for a, a couple of weeks or months. But the meditation practice has always pulled me through. And this is, uh, once again, it's the greatest gift that mind can give to itself because it's something that's always there. And I guess I'd maybe just like to say one other quick little thing about what it is that's always there. And it's the space, it's the quietness, within me that I always have and even when things are going crazy outside if I can find my way there it doesn't matter what's happening out on the street or what's happening uh, with my bank account or with my ex-partner or anything like none, none of that else matters because this is always here and it's always the same from my own meditation practice mm -hmm. I've experienced that it wasn't even the biggest challenge to make time every day. For me, the biggest challenge actually was that I found it very, very frustrating that I couldn't get to the state of quieting my mind, of finding this peace and silence you were just talking about. What mm -hmm. would you give as an advice to make some progress in this area? Well, there's two things I would say. The first thing is, is that we do have a 40-second short here on YouTube, 
you'll find it up in the upper corner right now, um, about taming the monkey mind. And uh, I'll leave that one for you guys to find out for yourself. But the other thing that I would just mention is, is and I've talked very, very quickly about it here earlier, is there's something that we always have with us, and it's our breath. And we can do this right now if we want. We can just put our hands on our knees and breathe slowly in through the nose. Out through the mouth. In through the nose. Through the mouth. And already I'm in a different place. And I'll promise I'll talk about this in the near future. This is this is called shamata or shine, and uh, recollection of the breath. And no matter where you go, you always have your breath with you. And if we can just manage maybe 10 or 30 seconds of just slow, easy breathing like this, just feeling how the, 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 the temperature of the air tickles your nose, how the air feels coming down your trachea into your lungs, how your diaphragm moves up and or down and up. <laughs> this is something that you can always do wherever you are. And uh, this, is, this can be very, very helpful for calming yourself. Beautiful. Thank you so much for this short practice. No problem. And now my last question would be, what person has influenced your relationships the most? Well, since I've been practicing meditation in Buddhism, I would have to say that it's my Lama. And a Lama is, I guess, basically a teacher. But not just any teacher. A Lama is a realized teacher. So what that means is someone who's practiced, maybe done a retreat, um, but really, really practiced hard, and someone who demonstrates in tactile, in realistic ways, the teachings of the Buddha. Someone who can show you what love is. Someone who can show you what compassion is. And I can't think of a better example in my life than my Lama. He works tirelessly for other people. Every day of his life, for a long, long time, and he just doesn't stop. And if I can be half as useful as he is when I'm his age, I will be a really, really happy, happy Buddhist. That sounds really amazing. So if I now would decide that I also would like to have a Lama in my life, how would I find a Lama? Mm, good question. I found my Lama by making a wish. I was practicing meditation uh, at home by myself and I just said, well, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just sitting here, breathing, meditating, imagining stuff. Maybe I'll break my mind. And then I said, I, I need a teacher. And then I made the wish. And I stopped meditating for about three months. And then all of a sudden, I was, there was a sign. <laughs> I was driving down the road and there was a sign on the side of the road that said, Buddhist lecture this day. And I'm like, yeah, this is exactly what I've been working for, looking for. And uh, that's kind of how it works. I actually have sort of manifested my, my teacher into my life. And the Tibetans explain it like this, that when, when the student is ready, the teacher will come. And I was ready. And the teacher came. And uh, maybe you have to try one or two or three. I, I didn't. For me, it was love at first sight. Um, but I understand if you know, you need to see one or two different directions. I mean, there's so many different types of Buddhist adventures that a guy can have with his mind. Uh, I mean, Tibetan Buddhism, there's Zen, there's Theravada, there's, um, yeah, and I'm sure there's even a couple of other ones that don't come to the top of my head right now. But 
even within Tibetan Buddhism, there's four or five lineages that, that are different from one another, that have a different way of coming to the same point. But that's the beauty of the Buddhist, the, of the Buddha Dharma, is that there's more ways to, to arrive at this point than one can imagine. There's like, for every type of person there is, there's, there's a way. And you have to find out what type of person you need as a, as a lama. And it might take a few tries, but I think you'll know when you find him or her, because women could be lamas too. That's really great to hear. So, Wen, thanks for all these great insights. Is there any last statement that you want to share? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Lyra and I work really, really hard for her to produce content like this. And if you like it, please give us a hand and like, subscribe, and share it with family, friends, and like-minded people who might also enjoy and be enlightened by content like this. Yeah, that's so true. Mm -hmm. And of course, we do not only have content like meditation and Buddhism, we also talk a lot about twin flames and relationships and healing. So, coming from this area, I would like to remind you to always be kind and loving and compassionate to all our fellow Earthlings. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. See you soon. Bye-bye.